We are fortunate to have Dr. Christopher Breeder provide our next lecture. Chris currently serves as a reviewer in the Division of Neurology Products at the FDA. His interests include rare neurological diseases. He also teaches at Johns Hopkins and the NIH. Chris received his MD and his PhD in Neurological Science from the University of Chicago and completed his residency and clinical fellowship at Johns Hopkins. He did postdoctoral studies in molecular neurobiology, where he also completed at the University of Chicago and Johns Hopkins. I'm confident you're going to enjoy today's lecture. Good evening. Thank you all for coming, um, especially uh, not only those who are here, but those who are online. I understand there's a lot of you. Um, my name is Chris Brader. We uh, self-introduce now, I guess. So I'm one of your colleagues from the FDA. Uh, been there for about seven years. Before that, I was in industry for about 11, and I'm uh, both an anesthesiologist and uh, a neuroscientist by training. So like all good FDA talks, here's my disclaimer that this view is mine. And actually, I have a lot of, one of the benefits of my industry background is I have a lot of sort of business things in here as well as FDA things. So this isn't your typical drug development talk. So my objective is to present to you one strategy for the process for submitting a US marketing application, or what many people call clinical or drug development. And unlike many talks on this topic, I will also talk about increasing the value of the approved asset. The other name for that is life cycle management or post-marketing strategy. This, every year I try to do something a little novel. This is my addition this year. So I typically just teach about what you do. And this is sort of a quick introduction on how to do it or how to start a drug development program. So once, uh, I'll say for now, once you have a drug, but we'll talk about the exact timing later. Um, but once you have a drug, the first thing you do is produce something known as a target product profile. And that is a document that contains the attributes of that product that, are, that differentiate it from your competition and, and other products. And from that, you develop a clinical development plan. We're going to talk about the clinical development plan today. If it's not in your clinical development plan, it's not going to be something that you can really capitalize on for your product. And then finally, um, once you're done your studies and you have your data, that goes into something known as the labeling, or that little package that the pharmacist has that unfolds to about this big with 0.2 size font. Has anyone ever read one of those before? They're very, many people say that anesthesiologists read the Wall Street Journal while they're doing cases. I actually used to read package inserts, which is sort of geeky. I guess that's why I'm here now. Okay, so this is the general strategy of, of how you do that. And this, of course, is an approval letter. It's actually a, a drug I worked on there. So that, in a certain sense, is your goal. Many people want to know, when should I start working on my target product profile? When do you think that would be? When does a drug development team start this? Any, any guesses? Right, and even before the beginning, because once you synthesize your drug and you start testing it, you can't change it at all. All you can do is study it. So before you actually pick a drug candidate, you need to know what you want, what sort of attributes, because the, the scientists, the drug discovery folks, can actually do something to help you pick a drug that actually does what you want. While the intent of this lecture is not to go into the discovery process, in one of my lifetimes, 
Um, I worked with the discovery and marketing folks at that early stage, and I thought it was really fascinating. So I'll show you some slides about how they do their, their business, or essentially, you know, where do new drugs come from? So there's many, is anyone here actually in the industry? Does anyone work in discovery or do you consult? So it's really a, a fascinating process. At least one of the places where I was had this machine called the Haystack, I think it was, and they had millions of compounds. And you could develop an assay and then screen all those compounds for that. And then you would do structure activity work. So that's for new molecular entities. You do this sort of fishing. You can do structure activity, relationships, et cetera. It's very chemistry heavy. It's very exciting every week to have the chemists come in with 50 compounds and they show you all the things they've done. Uh, biologics, uh, there's just a wealth of places where drugs can come from there. And reformulations are also a very popular uh, type of drug development. And uh, the formulation chemists come up with all kinds of things that, make the, that modify the profile of the bioavailability of the drug uh, there. So this is a, a picture of that high throughput screening process. Once a candidate is selected uh, from there, it goes through something that different companies call it different things. Where I was, they called it development lead selection. Let's say you have four candidates. So the first step, it might go through receptor binding. You might find it binds to a target. You don't like the serotonin 2B receptor is somewhat unpopular. So you might knock out certain candidates from there. You might do some early bioavailability studies in, in animals and also uh, pharmacodynamic screens, keep knocking it out. You might do some preliminary toxicology work as well as uh, what's known as ADME, which is the in vitro PK uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And you might not want certain ADME profiles, so you can knock that out. And according to this screen, then you would pick molecule B, and then you would have a development candidate. In industry, the popular expression is throwing it over the fence or something like that. It actually takes a lot for a molecule to be born to get into the clinic. Um, for all those that fail in the clinic, thousands fail before this step. Um, so this is your time before you do this to think about what assays do I want so I can get closer to my target product profile. For example, back when I was doing this, antipsychotic drug development was very big. And there was a theory at least that binding to histamine receptors led to obesity. So if that was in fact true, you might put a histamine receptor screen in here and throw out everything that binds a certain histamine receptor or what have you. But if you don't do that, once you pick that drug, you're stuck with it. Um, so the time to work on your target product profile is at, literally at the beginning. As soon as you say, I want to develop a drug, that's when you do it. So like most, most lectures, they say, say what you want to say, say it, and then say it again. Well, this is the punchline for the whole lecture. This is a map of a strategy for uh, drug development. It's sort of the most typical map. It gets modified extensively depending on what type of drug you're developing. But if you understand why this is the typical map, it's very easy to modify, to shorten. You might need to add something, what have you. So what I'm going to do in the bulk of the lecture is to derive this map. And there's a, a wisdom in drug development lecturing that you should start at the end, okay, and work your way forward. 
When I first gave this lecture, I used to do it from the beginning and work my way the other way. So now I do it, I go backwards and all, which makes sense too. It's uh, what's the least that I need to do to march backwards from each step. But I'm not gonna talk through it now, but slowly but surely, we're gonna build this map. You're gonna get a sense of how to uh, develop most, most drug candidates. So these are the aims for drug development. If you had a lecture on uh, how to apply for a marketing application, um, someone would tell you that the application is either called a BLA, Biological License Application, or an NDA, New Drug Application. And there's a common form that companies fill out in that application. It's called a Common Technical Document. And the three major functions that uh, review that at the FDA are the chemists, CMC, the pharmacology, toxicology folks, and the clinical folks. And since my lecture is on clinical development programs, I am only going to talk about clinical. So here's the goal for clinical. You need to establish efficacy and safety for a drug or biologic uh, in a dose range and schedule that provides an acceptable risk-benefit relationship. So we'll talk about each of these uh, components. And before we do, I thought I would show you where the bar is. Where is it? Where is that derived? You know, how high do I have to jump to get over this bar? And this is from the actual law upon which almost all of drug development is based, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. Um, and there's actually six, six ways to not, six ways to fail. And this he or she refers to the commissioner. They always refer to the commissioner will do this or that, um, or their designee. So there are six ways for the commissioner to refuse it. And if you look at this, one, two, and four are all different ways of saying you have to demonstrate that the drug is safe. And number three is a chemistry rule. Number five is the rule that talks about efficacy. We're gonna talk a bunch about this phrase here, substantial evidence and what that means. And then six is about patent stuff and we'll leave that to the lawyers. So first let's talk about efficacy. It's the first part of that statement and all. I think of all the phrases in, in the regulatory field, the one you would think is the most discussed, the most talked about is efficacy. Um, because you actually can't study safety unless your drug is efficacy. You can always pick a dose for your drug that's safe, right? If you have a billionth of a pharmacologically effective dose, that's not going to have many side effects. Um, but if you bring that dose up to where it's actually affecting the pharmacodynamics you want, that's when you start to see toxicities. Um, so efficacy is very important. And as it turns out, probably the least defined and discussed word in the regulatory literature is efficacy. It's actually very hard to find a definition <clears throat> that really pins it down. In fact, when it does discuss it, it talks more about something called effectiveness, which uh, you're actually taught, you know, when you're at the agency as something different. Uh, but efficacy uh, essentially is just the power for the drug to produce an effect. And the effect that it has to produce is the one that you propose in your drug labeling, okay? And we'll get to that more when we look at the substantial evidence uh, wording. Effectiveness, on the other hand, is a more real world uh, definition, how well the drug really works 
uh, in real life situations. That's something that the, the payers and the, the pharmacies are actually more concerned with than can you in some staged event demonstrate that you can produce a pharmacodynamic effect. So why do we care about efficacy? Well, you need to make sure the drug works. <clears throat> and importantly, much of drug promotion is based on the labeling. So, um, so efficacy is very important. And as I just mentioned, you need to assess safety in the context of an efficacious dose here. Are there any chemists here? I actually, my first life was a chemist. Paracelsus was like the father of chemistry there. And the first uh, credited with being the father of toxicology also. And then as I mentioned, some uh, authorities are particularly interested in effectiveness. Um, even if you can get a drug approved, that doesn't mean they want it on their formulary. It really needs to add something. So this is the actual legal definition around efficacy. And as I mentioned, this term substantial evidence is very important. And the law, which believe it or not, this part didn't come around till the 60s, around the thalidomide uh, events for those who are fans of history, said that you need evidence from adequate and well-controlled investigations with a, the S is very prominent here, including clinical investigations, that the drug will have the effect it purports under the conditions in the labeling. And then later it was added that if the secretary, so my apologies, it's not the commissioner, it's always the secretary or the secretary's designee. Uh, if the secretary determines based on relevant science one, uh, trial plus something known as confirmatory evidence, which is evidence which can add to a clinical trial such that you believe that the drug actually has the effect it purports. This came around uh, 1997, this rule right here. So the critical thing here is that to have substantial evidence, which is essentially the evidence you need uh, to be convincing in a marketing application with no other evidence, you need two adequate and well-controlled uh, trials. So, and this is what adequate and well-controlled means. And this right here, the last slide was from the law. This is from the regulations, which are derived from the law. So from this document right here, so this defines the type of trials that one looks for uh, to provide substantial evidence. And as you read this, has anyone here ever helped write or read a clinical protocol? So you can, you'll see this in all the protocols, right? So you have different treatments, objectives, um, inclusion, exclusion criteria, uh, methods of randomization, also other ways to minimize bias like blinding, single blind, double blind, etc. And um, the, the outcome measures or endpoints are well defined, and then an uh, analysis plan. So these are all things you sort of take for granted in a protocol, but they have their, their legal basis. So now we've covered the first of those requirements, efficacy. So the rule is, unless you have contributory evidence, which can be other clinical evidence, sometimes uh, non-clinical evidence suffices, you should plan on doing two adequate and well-controlled trials, especially for a brand new drug, um, reformulated drugs. And of course, there are many other exceptions, but if all you're doing is making the drug a controlled release, and it's already been approved as an immediate release, of course you know that the molecule itself has an effect, so that would be contributory evidence. So you, you more than likely would not need to do two trials. So 
We've established that. So now we're going to find out how do I get to that stage of two adequate and well-controlled phase three trials. Um, before we do, there, is anyone here in clinical pharmacology? No one this time. Well, you'll recall, was anyone here for Dr. Peck's lecture? I think I recognize some of you from last week. Well, he's, he's a clinical pharmacologist, very big advocate of studying clinical pharmacology. There are some clinical pharmacology studies that you need even to get the ball rolling, okay? They're the very first things you do, and we'll talk about them in a minute. But there are some that you typically don't do until the very end. And one reason is because you want to make sure the drug actually works before you do some of these, because these are horrifically expensive studies. And also, if these patients aren't your primary patient that the indication is for, you may not need these studies to conduct the phase three study, but you'll eventually want the information in your labeling. And chief among them are these studies, the renal and hepatic impairment studies, drug interaction studies. So if your early non-clinical data suggests you have a drug interaction, you're going to want to do those, those studies. And many, act, many people actually say you want to do that before your phase threes, because if you're worried about a drug interaction, you have to exclude those people from your phase three study. And you don't want to exclude anyone that you don't have to from a phase three study, because that will limit the population you can study, which will slow you down and also give you a more restricted labeling. OK. But very often, they are excluded from phase two studies because you aren't sure if the drug works yet. So to do these programs would be you know, not a not a good business decision, usually, unless the exceptions are if your drug is for these patients, you, you want to know that beforehand. And also, if you have a strong signal for any of these, um, it's best to study it as soon as possible. If, you have, if you're developing a drug for psychiatry and you suspect that it interacts with cytochrome, the CYP3A4, Many other psychiatry drugs are metabolized by that. So you would be well advised to study that very soon. So you could either, you might even kill the drug based on that. Uh, because if your competitors don't have that and you need to have a very complicated dosing, um, you want to know that right up front. So now we have this part of the map. We're going to sort of draw the map backwards. All right, so new drug application, filing, uh, two adequate and well-controlled phase three studies, and then these ClinPharm studies. So going <coughs> back here, the next part of the map we'll talk about is this concept of a dose range and schedule. Very important. So question is, how do I get to my two adequate and well-controlled studies? You, optimally, you would do phase two studies, and to be specific, phase two B. And for me personally, um, phase two is any study that involves patients where the object is to study the effect of dose on either safety or efficacy. And the B refers to uh, studying typically studying efficacy is, is the primary objective. Phase 2A studies tend to be for uh, safety questions. All right, so phase 2, I often say it's the lone wolf, very unloved, because it's not really strictly required in the regulations. No one says you have to do a phase 2. Um, but could be very, it's, could be very wise to do it. It's always good to know more about your drug before you spend about three or four hundred million dollars on your phase three program. But I would have to say um, many programs don't do phase two studies. 
Um, so, and they don't do them because these trials are almost as long and expensive, whoops, as phase three studies. And the question is, can they be registrational? And the answer is, you know, they can. If you pre-specify your analysis plan, the difference typically is that you don't have as many subjects in them, and you really are exploring. But if your drug really works well and you happen to get a positive uh, study, especially in rare diseases, no one's going to quibble between whether it was called a phase two and three. Um, so they can be registrational. And there are cases where it doesn't make too much sense to do phase two studies, such as when you're doing modified release formulations with well-behaved uh, PK in your molecule. If you have a drug that typically doses at 100 milligrams a day for the immediate release, um, you're probably safe not doing a phase two study. You're going to want about the same, uh, the same dosage. Now, there have been some modified release drugs where uh, they only had like 70% of the bioavailability. And so after they did their studies, they bumped it up. But that was all based on PK, PK results. And the other thing you might consider is one of the main reasons to make a modified release drug is to sort of cut off the Cmax to make it more tolerable. So you might actually be able to put more drug into the, into the pill than was in the immediate release. It might be more tolerable with a slower absorption, but you need to make sure you have all the non-clinical work that supports that. This is a fairly famous example of when phase two was not done. In this uh, study for this drug, chlorothaladone, um, it was actually marketed before much dose exploration was done and had very bad side effects. And then a dose response study was done and it was seen, it's at chlorothaladone, it's an antihypertensive drug, uh, was actually seen that there is a ceiling effect on the fall in blood pressure and just pushing the dose higher was just increasing the toxicity. So, um, the time you, what's the expression? Never a better, you know, you need to make a very good first impression. It's very bad to launch a drug twice, especially if the first time you launched it, it had a bad safety profile. Uh, given the cost of it, it makes sense to do it wisely. So this is, uh, this is a good rationale for doing phase two so you understand the dose of your drug. And these are different types of uh, dose response measurements you can look for. One is the maximal tolerated dose, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That's often gotten in the second study of the whole series, which I'll describe, called the MAD study. You might also look for the minimal efficacious dose. You want to look at the curve um, that leads up to that. Is it a very steep curve or a very flat sort of curve. And also titration is incredibly important. And we'll talk about uh, the cases that it seems most important almost toward the end of the lecture. So now we have this part of our map built, right? NDA from phase three, and we've done our phase two B studies and these sort of late phase uh, clin farm studies. So the question is now, how do I get to my phase two? So what happens at phase two that I need to prepare for? Well, phase two uh, has extended exposure of drug, can have many subjects into the hundreds. People, they're actually patients, right, phase two. So they'll have different diseases and concomitant medications. And um, so to do all this, you need to really understand your drug. And 
Also, some people don't think it's wise to go from a two week to a year exposure of the drug, so they put something intermediate in in case there's some toxicity associated with extended exposure. But, but especially since this is a ClinPharm course, I'll emphasize that it's very important to really understand your drug before you go into patients because they can be very uh, unpredictable. So now we've been working backwards in the scheme. Now I'm gonna do a, an end around and we're gonna actually start from the very beginning. All right, and this is the beginning of all the clinical pharmacology studies. Did you talk at all about first in human studies before? All right, so I'll not go too slow on that. So of course the first study in humans, sometimes called the first in human study, also called the single ascending dose studies. And to do that, at least in the United States, if that's your first study, you need to submit an investigational new drug application, which includes, uh, for the most part, non-clinical studies. This is the guidance. Carl Peck talked about guidances. This is a great read. Even a clinician like me can get through that document. It's written very well. Um, <clears throat> you also need the supporting chemistry documentation. And it gives you some safety and tolerability uh, information only for a single dose, and uh, also data for PK modeling. So as Dr. Peck explained, modeling <coughs> has a very important place in drug development. You really start getting data right here. And what it allows is this study is called the SAD study. Well, after you're SAD, then you can get MAD, multiple ascending dose study. And um, this, you typically pick three or four dose levels and uh, push the dose until it's not really tolerated. And the reason you do that is because you don't want to go into phase three not having known what the top of your tolerability curve is. You don't want to underdose, you know, because you'll never be able to go, you will be able to go back again, but phase three studies are terrifically expensive. And when you tell your boss that you didn't pick the optimal dose, you probably won't be the one who's repeating this. All right, just I'm sure you've had this, what you get from a single ascending dose study. This is a uh, time curve for exposure, you get the area under the curve, also known as exposure, the C max, concentration max, um, the T max right here, various metrics you get. And as I mentioned, typically you go on, the next study is a multiple ascending dose study. Prerequisite would be a single ascending dose study plus supporting non-clinical information, and this really gives, this is one of the most valuable pieces of information, your maximal tolerated dose. So you go up to where you have a, a toxicity you don't want and go down, and that's your maximal tolerated dose. It's not the dose that gave you the toxicity. And um, critical PK data, one of the most critical ones here is known as C-min. You notice I didn't have that on the single dose. Well, the C-min is also known as the trough level. It's the lowest level before you take the pill again. And for many drugs and classes, it's thought to be really the critical uh, plasma level, like uh, any epileptic drugs. The C-min needs to stay above a certain uh, floor level. Once it goes below that, you start having seizures again. Whereas other drug classes, you think about different things, like antimicrobials, you think about the C-max more. You want the drug to go up and spike, kill the bugs, come down like that. And that's one reason why some modified release antibiotics don't always work as well, because they don't have that spike. Oops. <laughs> 
So what the MAD study gives you is it helps you select the dose for phase two. And there are some studies you need to do in ClinForm where you need to know the top clinical dose, such as a food effects study and a QT study. I think you've been introduced to the QT study before. Is that right? Yeah. And this is what the data looks like. This is actually data from two different types of experiments. Here we see with the unfilled circles what a four-time-a-day drug looks like. Here's the C-max, here are the C-mins. And this is a modified release drug, so it has, it's taken once a day, and it has one peak. See how the C-min is a little lower than that? So that could be a little concerning depending on what this drug is for. If this is an analgesic drug, you're typically not as worried. The pain relief level is often more related to the AUC. But if this is an anti-epileptic drug, your difference is about 230 to 170. Okay, so that amount may or may not be critical. This is your MAD study. All right, so now we have our map again. All right, and these are actually, this is the beginning, and this actually isn't quite the end. Um, we'll get to the end soon. Does anyone know the phrase for what the, the shortest series of studies to go from beginning to end is called? It's an expression people like to sort of throw around these days. It's called the critical path. So the critical path, those are the studies that define your, your timeline, all right? Because these studies here, you can do almost any time, right? You can shove them forward or back, but you start with SAD and you go to NDA. There's actually one more thing here, so it's not really your critical path, but any slip, whoops, any slip up of the timeline of any of these studies and the whole project timeline shifts forward. Whereas if your drug interaction timeline slips, it's not gonna have as big an effect. So when you're the person responsible for the critical path, there's a lot of pressure on you. So other supporting ClinFarm studies are listed here will sort of quickly go through them. The thorough QT study, which I think Dr. Peck may have explained, this is the arrhythmia torsade de point right here. Generally, if you see that on TV, that's not a good thing. You don't want your heart to do this. It should really look like this right here. So the QT goes from here to here and that gets prolonged and then the heart just decides to do what it wants to do and this is one thing it does. And there are certain drug interactions that are known to cause this, so the FDA is very focused on that. Others, food effect study. Food effect study is a type of study called a bioequivalent study. Bioequivalent studies are hypothesis driven studies where you want to compare one condition to another. So the condition here is fed versus fasting. You're actually testing a hypothesis. The hypothesis is that they're no different. Okay. Um, dose linearity. You want to know that there's a predictable increase in exposure with dose, this is another bioequivalence type study. You actually <clears throat> normalize the data for the dose and then do bioequivalence calculations between the different dose levels because they should be the same. Dose proportionality. Very often there's, if you have three pill sizes, one, two, and four milligrams, you want to make sure that four times one is the same as one times four. And you'd think, why wouldn't they be? Well, some pills have such a dose range that you actually need to make the ones at the top end a little different than the ones at the bottom end. You put different 
uh, things in there called excipients, which are the non-active parts. Um, because of the, the difference in the strength, they could actually be different formulations. Uh, metabolism studies. Um, if you were in my, I t also teach drug development at Hopkins in their online program. And usually I have a slide before this that shows a rat in a little metabolism cage and they collect its feces and urine and all that. And while we don't quite do that with humans, this is sort of the analogy that they actually give humans radioactive drug and they collect various fluids and they look at the metabolism of the drug. And this is done very early in the process because you want to have a handle on how the drug gets metabolized. Actually, this is something you've probably seen from experiments here, whole body autoradiography in an animal, usually done as tissue autoradiography. And this is the analogous situation in humans. It's not a required part of any development program, but it, it may inform about whether the drug penetrates into the brain. All right, so now we've added a few more ornaments onto our map right here, and we're gonna get to the very last part of this map, and that is safety. So what is required for safety? I won't read this to you, but there are actual numbers that are given for how many patients need to be exposed. And this is not an FDA-specific thing. These are actually part of rules from a group called uh, ICH, or International Conference on Harmonization, that's really an international agreement, which is good because now drug development is more global, so it allows material from one application to be usable throughout the world. You can see, though, that there's, for chronic drugs, you need to be treated for at least 100 for a year. And all this is subject to some reason. I did anesthetic drugs for a while, the regulation of them. And as you can imagine, something you're only going to get once or twice you don't need to keep giving for a year. So generally use some clinical sense in these numbers. So, but as a base case for chronic drugs, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, pain, what have you, you need 1,500 subjects exposed to a drug, 300 for six months, 100 for a year. And the number can change. It's usually not in the direction you want, depending on if you find something that needs to be studied a little more. And very often, people do these studies following their phase three studies called long-term extension studies that are tacked on open label studies as compared to double blind. Um, it is actually very expensive to blind medications. The clinical supplies for a clinical trial are very expensive, and they're really hard to coordinate, if you might imagine, especially if you're making drug cards up for the whole world, right? Drug cards in Russia, England, US. Um, it's just an extremely complex process. So these long-term extensions are, for the most part, open label. And they are for finding <clears throat> if you have uh, side effects, which we call adverse effects, that occur with prolonged exposure. So I note that right here. Visits are often less frequent. You often have, you know, you don't do all the pharmacodynamic assessments. And actually, these are not good for uh, studying efficacy or pharmacodynamics because there's no blinding. So everyone knows who's on what drug. So there's a lot of subjectivity there. This is a schematic diagram of what that uh, 
these studies look like. You go from a double-blind, randomized control trial to an open-label, long-term extension study. These little lollipops are the visits. You can see during the study, active versus placebo, the visits are very regular and very frequent. And then at the end of the randomized control period, uh, and this is just one way to do it. There's many ways to do it. Um, you down titrate the actives, you up titrate the placebos to a common dose. Now you can break the blind, right? Because everyone is on a common dose. And then once they get, once everyone's on that dose, then it's up to the physician who's their actual doctor to adjust the dose. They can go up or down or, or whatever they want. So this is how these trials work. You can also feed more drug-naive subjects in at this point uh, because you may need more subjects to meet that 1,500 subject exposure. So now we have the complete map, all right? This is the map you had at the beginning. It has the critical path, and you can see this is the element that was missing. Um, and the ClinFarm studies. These two ClinFarm studies are critical path studies. The others typically are not. Notice I, I put a little asterisk by thorough QT. Um, if there's a signal somewhere in your non-clinical that you need to be worried about the QT prolongation, that study is moved forward. But if you're not so concerned about it from your non-clinical data, that, like the these studies here is done later because this is also a terrifically expensive uh, study. And also, if it's supposed to be done at the top of the clinical dose range, you don't want to go in with a dose early on that may not be your top dose because then it won't be as useful for what you need it for. So here's my one slide on biologics. Biologic development is to a large extent, like small drug development, but there are some important differences because they are biologics. And the differences, so first you have a first in human. You often, well, you should have a multiple ascending dose study. This is a very subtle difference. The first study of small drugs is based on animal studies, based on the no observed adverse effect level, or no AEL, okay? But for various reasons in biologics, use a much more sensitive level, the no observed effect level. So it's not just an adverse effect, it's any effect. Does anyone know why we have that difference? It may have happened before your time. So I don't even know how many years it it was now, but I remember hearing about it on the radio. So maybe like seven, eight, something like that years ago, there was uh, an English study, I think, and they dosed everybody at once on something where the no AL predicted no toxicity, and everyone went into organ failure in that study. Um, the, you could look it up, it's called the Tegenero case, T-E-G-E-N something. Well, that also recently happened. And why it was is because the toxicity studies were done in monkeys, and they, weren't, they didn't have the same immune response that humans had. So um, if you based it on the effect level, it was way higher than it should have been. So ever since then, it's been based on the NOAL, and instead of reducing the level by 10, which you do with a NOAL, it's reduced by 100. So Everything is meant to be safer, of course. We still have things like the, the France event. So I've actually put two additional studies in here based on a general principle, and that is that if you give biologics, well, biologics have two special properties. One is that they tend to outlast their presence in the bloodstream, um, whereas small drugs, Generally, by the time they're eliminated, which is five half-lives, plus or minus some, the effect goes down. But biologics may have a uh, prolonged effect. 
So you really need to understand what is the duration of effect. And the second thing you need to understand is that a lot of the toxicity of biologics happens when you're just giving the drug, when you're administering it. And the faster you put it in, the more likely you are to have these nasty infusion reactions with cytokines released and people draw these charts with arrows all over and um, it's just really ugly. One class I have, I actually show the pictures and it's, it's not pleasant before dinner. Um, so you really need to understand how fast you can put the drug in and how high you can put the drug in because just like a, a small molecule, um, if you can put it in safer, you might be able to put in a higher level also. Uh, but it's definitely bad news if you put these drugs in too fast because you get cytokine release and, and it's not, not too good. And then after that, uh, some of the ClinPharm studies are different. So, um, you know, you don't typically need to worry about a food effect because you're not eating the biologic like the pill, it's generally going in IV. Um, and many of these are broken down like the proteins in a manner different than small molecules, so you may not need to do the hepatic impaired study, uh, but it's a case by case, really. So that's basic drug development. That is one scheme of how to do it. And you can do drug development a million ways, but it helps to understand why the basic scheme is laid out the way it is, and then you can decide what you want to take out or add. <clears throat> now I'll talk a little bit about post-marketing development. It's really when much of the work actually starts in a drug development. I was on a, one team that had about 30 people before the NDA, and about 400 people after the NDA. You know, I started five trials at once on this drug. It's just, um, it's very exciting. <laughs> so these, I'll talk now about some of the different options. Oops. These are just some, you don't see a lot of data about the business of post-marketing development. I think people don't like to talk about drug development in general. It just seems like something they want to keep in the back. But here's a, what little information I could find I throw on a slide here. These are the different ways you can prolong the life of your drug. First, always, of course, the litigation, citizens' petitions. You can have pricing strategies, uh, pediatrics, new indications, new formulations. You need to start on your next generation of drug and combination drugs. And this shows, uh, based on a survey, uh, how different companies attempt to do this. You can see one of the main ones is new formulations. Okay, something the patient can actually benefit from. Uh, this shows return on investment, pediatric exclusivity now, especially that it's given six months of pediatric exclusivity can amount to a pretty good chunk of money. Lipitor made about $10 billion a year, so $5 billion will buy you something, right? It'll fund at least two or three new chemical entities if spent well. Uh, modified release formulations are very popular. There are some companies that do nothing but this, right? Very cool if you're a chemist to be involved in this. They have these uh, drug with different types of polymers around it, and they can pretty much reproduce any profile you want. They can even make a controlled release profile that looks on a daily basis like an immediate release profile. So instead of taking two or three pills in a day to get the immediate release profile, you take one and they have like five or six different beads in them. And then all of a sudden that bead does its thing and releases drug and, and so forth. It's actually out on the market now. And the reason you might want to do that is because there is evidence, especially with some G protein coupled <clears throat> receptor effects, like for amphetamines with ADHD, 
in opioids with analgesia that a sort of smooth release profile actually causes receptor downregulation. So you don't want something nice and flat, otherwise your receptors go to sleep. You want to kind of spike it up and down. This is the picture I showed you before. So we went from a four time a day to a once a day. Your main concern is this drop in the C-min. Sometimes that's critical and sometimes it's not. But believe me, any difference between the two, the clinical reviewer, the Clin Farm reviewer is going to note, and you'll have to rationalize why that's not an issue. Here I just have some notes on how the development program for a modified release is different. Um, generally, you need to do less toxicology work, especially if the immediate release was done before. Your real goal in modified release development is either convenience, because it is important to, it's much easier to have a once a day drug than a four time a day drug. If you have a kid and you try to give them a pill, even a once a day drug is a pain. Four times a day will put you on the mat. Um, but also important, you generally get increased tolerability for the side effects that are PK dependent. Now, if my drug has a warning about something like hyponatremia or something like that, that's generally not a side effect that's sensitive to the PK of the drug. It's just a property of the molecule. So if I have a warning for that with the immediate release, there's a good chance I'm going to have that with a controlled release. And also things like anaphylaxis and things like that. But certain things, uh, especially with CNS and GI drugs like nausea, headache, dizziness, those seem to, those side effects seem to have a very nice response to controlled release drugs. And they are also important for the patients because no one wants to feel nauseous or get a headache. This is just a chart with more detailed information. One of the, some differences I'll point out, you don't generally do a single ascending dose and a multiple ascending dose because you already know what the tolerability and safety of the drug are, but you need to test a number of formulations. So you do that with a single dose with a bunch of formulations. You might have one arm for each that has a pilot fed because having a food effect with a modified release drug can be a drug killer. So you want to know if there's a big one. You're not going to have much sensitivity here. But if there's a whopping food effect, you want to know on the first study. So some people do that. And then you don't need to do a multiple ascending dose, but you do with the final formulation, you typically do a multiple dose. And uh, you might even put as one arm the uh, immediate release comparator, which takes care of this requirement, which is actually a regulatory requirement to study that. And then you'll see these are, are things you had to do before with the immediate release. And this is a very important one. Does anyone know the story about alcohol dumping? Turned out with one of the, f one of the first uh, controlled release opioids, that if grandma had her opiate with a scotch, it dumped. Okay, so all the opiate came out, and that's, that's not a good thing. So now the alcohol dumping is tested as a regular feature of a controlled release uh, formulation chemistry. First, it's done um, in, the, in the dish you know, with paddles and different concentrations of alcohol. And then if there's a signal, you actually do a, a study in humans with the pill and alcohol, which I guess probably gets a lot of volunteers. <laughs> uh, pediatric development is based on two laws, um, and actually they should be reversed. This one's known as PREA, that's the stick. <laughs> 
okay? That's the law that says you have to do studies in pediatrics if your indication is amenable to that. So that's part of the NDA process. You need a plan in your adult NDA, you know, to either have the data then or say that those studies are, are ongoing or going to be done. Um, and then the carrot is best pharmaceutical act for children. This is the law that gives the six months of exclusivity. And they have different regulatory features between the two, the two laws that I've listed here. For example, differences not required for orphan indications for PREA, um, et cetera. This WR written response, this is how the FDA requests these uh, BPCA studies. These get reviewed in a standard fashion. These are priority, et cetera. Slightly different regulatory features. Um, one way to think about pediatric studies I often say they come in three flavors. Some are expected with your NDA. It's hard to make a case for a drug for epilepsy or asthma that you don't need that labeling for kids. Um, on the other hand, ALS or Parkinson's, it's hard to make a case that you need to do those studies. Although I didn't know this until today, it turns out there's a pediatric variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome. So, um, you know, it depends on the epidemiology of the situation. And then something in the middle are diseases that kids do get, um, but it's not, you know, necessarily the fact that they typically start in childhood. So you can generally defer these studies till after the adult uh, indication is approved, you'll just have to do them afterwards. And then, of course, you need to do juvenile tox studies, typically. Uh, the typical program you would do, here's that phrase I mentioned earlier, a phase 2A study. There's many ways to do this, though, um, where your main goal is to get PK and tolerability, and then a phase three study, and some of the issues you need to be concerned with. Weight-based dosing is always difficult. Giving placebos to kids is, you know, it's really a case-by-case -case basis that needs to be worked on. There's a whole part of the ethics laws that deal with uh, using children in studies that's very complicated, so you need an ethics uh, consultant to wade through that. Over-the-counter drugs, I always thought over-the-counter drugs were pretty cheap um, and didn't really net a lot of money, but uh, it turns out if you look at the over time, you know, they actually make, you know, quite a bit. Toothpaste alone makes $1 billion, all right, which is sort of like liquid sandpaper and all. It's, it's amazing, so that's why the companies and Generally, it's a lot less work over-the-counter drugs than a prescription drug. So there's, you know, less payoff at the end, but much less heartburn in the beginning. Speaking of heartburn, there's a billion dollars in it. Generally, over-the-counter drugs need to be self-diagnosable. Um, patient needs to be able to determine when the drug is appropriate, needs to be able to give it to themselves and need to know when they need to talk to a physician. One thing I'll say about over-the-counter drugs, has anyone ever gone to the drugstore and read like the box and all? It's imminently more readable than a prescription drug label. It's almost, in a geeky way, it's sort of enjoyable to read because you can really understand it. It's um, much harder to read a prescription drug package insert so I'll give, give some kudos and credit to the folks in, in OTC, because it's very usable. Uh, yeah, most of the studies in uh, over-the-counter are related to how much does the patient understand the labeling versus does the drug work. 
a lot of label comprehension things in a development program. Generic drugs, again, you always think, you know, generic, oh, it must be pretty cheap. They don't make money and all that and all. Oops. Lots, this isn't even a very new slide. It's probably much higher than this. Um, but generics is a pretty good business. And the deal with generic drugs, the labeling will be the same as what's known as the innovator drug. Sometimes, though, there exists like a patent that's still going on, and then the FDA will do what's called carving out that part of the labeling. Uh, let's say a drug has two indications and a generic wants to go on the market. You know, it's possible to carve out the one indication from the labeling, and it'll look identical to it except not with that indication if it's a use patent for example. All right. Okay, so in summary, clinical development is the part of the program where we talk about the dose relationship to safety and efficacy and evaluate the risk-benefit considerations. I really didn't talk about risk-benefit considerations. It's a whole lecture unto its own. Because uh, this is a ClinFarm course, the ClinFarm part of the program as Carl Peck said, it's a, driven by specific questions about how the drug and the patient interact. They allow all the other studies to go on, because if you don't really understand your drug, you really shouldn't be dosing hundreds of people. Efficacy, actually I didn't even address this. Efficacy. You can produce an effect and prove it, but that doesn't mean that you really have a drug. Um, it really needs to be a clinically meaningful thing, okay? Clinically meaningful hypothesis, okay? And then um, also, I didn't explicitly talk about this, but post-marketing planning should begin in parallel with the registrational program and the, uh, oops, and actually that fell off. But once your drug is approved, it's not the time to start your post-marketing program because these trials take years and the planning takes years. As soon as you know your drug has an effect at all, then all of the post-marketing planning and execution should be started at that point. Um, just like the TPP, you front load everything and then by the time your first indication gets approved, you have all your other trials ongoing, and in rapid succession, you'll be giving your sales force more and more to talk about. Um, and so that, that's what leads to a very successful drug development program. And with that, I'll take questions. <laughs>